Uh, we will start with the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Moran. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Kahn, um, would like to talk to you about something you said earlier today when you are talking with Mr. Massey. You said, quote, uh, we do things to make sure that the market has clarity. Uh, to make sure that the market has clarity was the quote I wrote down from you. And, and I was glad you brought that up because the Second Circuit, as you know, back in 1984, said of the FTC, quote, the commission owes a duty to define the conditions under which conduct would be unfair so that businesses will have an inkling as to what they are lawfully, what they can lawfully do rather than be left in a state of complete unpredictability. But by moving away from the consumer welfare standard, uh, I would posit that the FTC has effectively created uh, a moving goalpost standard. And Mr. Bentz pressed you on that several, with several questions, and you just said, well, basically, it kind of depends case by case. We're going to look at different laws. Is, is that effectively the summary of what you said and, and the, the guidance that was provided last year in the policy statement regarding the scope of unfair methods of competition under Section 5 of the FTC? So Section 5 of the FTC Act is a different statutory scheme than the Sherman Act, and so we look at case law that's specific to Section 5 and specific to the FTC Act when interpreting that provision. With respect to that November 10th, 2022 um, dissenting statement of Commissioner Christine Wilson as it relates to that Section 5 of the FTC and the policy statement, she stated this, uh, quote, unfortunately, instead of providing meaningful guidance to businesses, the policy statement announces that the commission has the authority summarily to condemn essentially any business conduct it finds distasteful. Uh, did it concern you that one of the commissioners would, uh, would issue such a statement and reach such a conclusion? So the benefits of having a multi-member commission is that we can have that discussion and debate and disagreement. And, you know, we always take seriously input that we're getting from other, other members of the commission. Uh, as you'll see in the policy statement itself, it has reflects decades of case law that our team took a very close look at to make sure that we were hewing very closely to this text of the statute as well as the relevant precedent. With respect to the early terminations issue that uh, Mr. Benz talked to you about earlier, I sent you a letter earlier this year about that issue, uh, and you wrote in response that granting early terminations causes or consumes agency resources. Can you explain how reinstating the early terminations diverts agency resources? Sure, so we, our staff is reviewing merger filings, they're in the process of litigating, they're investigating. When they are looking at the HSR filings, their primary goal, our statutory mandate, is to be identifying transactions that may violate the Clayton Act or any of the other antitrust laws. Granting early termination is a discretionary function and so we decide to put resources towards the mandatory functions in the statute over the discretionary but, ones. But for years, that early termination policy allowed the FTC to allow uh, mergers and acquisitions of a small size or a size where there was really no uh, competition issue uh, really presented for you to go ahead and give surety to those businesses that they could proceed with those mergers and acquisitions. But that's no longer the case in the FTC, right? You're, you're holding businesses in limbo because you're giving them these letters and saying, well, we're, we're going to look at it. We're, we're not sure. But then businesses have trouble moving forward with those mergers and acquisitions because sometimes the financing is tied up in the time frame that they need a quick M&A. Is that, is that true or is that untrue? So, Congressman, the context here is we're talking about 30 days. 30 days the firms have to wait before they're able to consummate if they don't hear from the agencies. In the past, maybe firms would have gotten early termination on day 25. Now they're not getting it, but after day 30, they're able to consummate. So we've decided that as a matter of where we're allocating our resources, it's a better use of resources to be identifying which transactions may be creating problems for consumers, for workers, for honest businesses, rather than prioritize the kind of five days that firms may have um, gotten in the past. It, it seems that uh, a lot of the resources, when you talk about allocation of resources, have been going towards new rulemaking in the FTC, rather than actually working through some of these issues that you guys are looking at, some of which you should be looking at, some of which you probably shouldn't be looking at. 
is, is that the reason why in 2020 the FTC brought 31 challenges to mergers, which was a two-decade high, but in 2021, the year you became chair, the FTC took only 15 actions against mergers, and in 2022, only 17 actions. Is that because you're focused too much on rulemaking and all your resources are allocated in that direction? So there are no real, I mean, we have look, we're proposed a rule to update the HSR form in the Bureau of Competition, but aside from that, the vast majority of resources are focused on enforcement. Um, I think some of those numbers you mentioned are outdated. Uh, our team would be happy to provide you with updated numbers. Our enforcement is squarely in line with prior years. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields.